My name is Nordin Helassa, and I graduated a PhD in biochemistry from the French National Institute from Agronomic Research. I'm a British Heart Foundation Fellow and a tenure track fellow at the University of Liverpool. And my uh, current research interest is the role of calcium binding proteins in cardiac muscle contraction. So why did I choose this particular paper? So I found quite interesting the similarities you can see between cardiac muscle contraction and glucose stimulated insulin secretion. As you can see in both uh, phenomena, you have a key role of uh, calcium ions and voltage gated uh, calcium channels in both cases. So in cardiac muscle contraction, when you have an action potential which depolarizes the membrane, then you have the opening of the L-type calcium channel that allow calcium to enter and activate uh, the Rindin receptor from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then you get more calcium into the cytoplasm, which promotes uh, cardiac muscle contraction. So in, in glucose stimulated insulin secretion, you still have the same three steps of membrane depolarization, activation of calcium channels, and then uh, the physical output. Um, the, or the major difference, I would say, is that the, the, the way the depolarization of the membrane is created, so in this case, is the entry of glucose, which when it will go through um, the Krebs cycle, we generate ATP, which will then block the KATP channels, and this is this blockage that will depolarize the membrane and activate uh, the calcium channels. So in their paper, uh, the authors have used quite a nice combination of techniques ranging from calcium imaging, biochemistry and electrophysiology to identify a new regulator of uh, the calcium, um, of the voltage dependent calcium channel, which is T-SPAN7. So I'm not going to say uh, any more and I'm just going to hand over to Arya, who is going to describe in more details uh, some of their exciting work. Right, thank you, Nordin. And firstly, I want to I want to thank the organizers for inviting us as panelists for the Journal of Physiology's Virtual Journal Club. And so uh, for today's discussion, I'll give a brief introduction uh, where I'll discuss the importance of calcium in glucose stimulated insulin secretion. And I'll briefly talk about how L-type voltage gated calcium channels or the CAV channels mediate calcium entry. And also I'll briefly mention the role of auxiliary subunits in the regulation of CAV channel function. And then we'll dive into what is currently known about tetraspanins uh, in the regulation of CV channel activity. And this will be followed by uh, a discussion of the results of our study, which will be presented by Matt, who will show you that T-SPAN7, which is shown here in red, interacts with the L-type CAV channel. And by doing so, it decreases glucose-stimulated calcium influx and insulin secretion. Uh, and so a lot of work has gone into establishing the consensus model for glucose-stimulated insulin secretion, uh, which shows that calcium entry through the voltage-dependent calcium channels is critical for insulin secretion. And this was first shown by Gerald Grotsky in 1966, whereupon stimulation with glucose, islets that were perfused with medium containing calcium, showed the typical glucose-stimulated insulin secretory response. Whereas upon removal of calcium from the perfusion medium, uh, which is shown here in dashed lines, you can see there was a complete inhibition of glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. And so going back to the consensus model, you can see the beta cell here responds to glucose stimulation by increasing the ATP to ADP ratio, thereby resulting in the closure of KATP channels, leading to depolarization of the beta cell membrane. And this activates the voltage-dependent calcium channels, uh, thereby leading to calcium influx and subsequently insulin secretion. And so this beta cell calcium entry uh, upon glucose-mediated depolarization is shown here on the right, where you see an increase in the inward currents to the L-type CME channels uh, at, at depolarized membrane potentials. And this inward currents contribute to the upward stroke of the action potentials. And so there's action potential firing is in part controlled by the opening and closing of, uh, of CAV channels that leads to the development of calcium oscillations and pulsatile insulin secretion. And so interestingly, the activity of the CAV channel uh, is controlled by a variety of auxiliary protein subunits. Uh, so as you can see here, uh, the alpha subunit, which is the pore forming subunit of the CAV channel, 
forms complexes with other subunits like the extracellular alpha-2 subunit, the transmembrane delta subunit, uh, the intracellular beta subunit, and importantly, the four-pass transmembrane gamma subunit. And uh, what is also interesting is that the activity of CAV channels is also controlled by the tissue-specific expression of these auxiliary proteins, leading to differential regulation of the CAV channel function depending on the expression levels of these subunits in various tissues in the body. And so coming to tetraspanins, I would like to point out that tetraspanins structurally resemble to the gamma, gamma subunit of the CAV channels, which was shown on the previous slide. And so as you can see, T-spans have four transmembrane domains, a small and a large extracellular loop. And the large extracellular loop has this CCG uh, conserved motive, which is important for protein function. And also uh, is, it's important for regulation of the interaction of T-spans with its interacting partners. And so a few years ago, a German group uh, showed that tetraspanin 13, which is shown here in yellow, interacts with the voltage sensing domain of the N-type CAV channels and affects calcium uh, CAV channel function in neurons. And specifically, tetraspanin 13 accelerates activation and inactivation kinetics of the N-type CAV channels. And by doing so, it decreases the voltage sensitivity and channel open probability which is shown here in, in the black solid line uh, in neurons or expressing T-SPAN 13. And so what this paper demonstrated was that T-SPAN 13 serves as an important interaction partner of the N-type CV channels and is likely to play an important role in uh, neurotransmitter release in neurons. And so coming to T-SPAN 7, which is the focus of today's discussion. So T-SPAN 7 is a highly expressed uh, uh, protein in the endocrine cell types, including the alpha cells, the beta cells, and the delta cells in both mouse and human pancreas. And at the protein level, you can see T-SPAN7 protein is enriched in the pancreas as compared to the other tissues. So interestingly, T-SPAN7 forms protein complexes with a variety of critical proteins that are involved in various intracellular processes, including the three that are shown here. And so T-SPAN7 uh, regulates F-actin dynamics by interacting with uh, PIC1, which indirectly regulates the, uh, the activity of the actin-related protein ARP2 and 3, which normally function to reduce cranial exocytosis and hormone secretion. And so then the loss of T-SPAN7 would be predicted to enhance cranial trafficking and islet hormone secretion at basal glucose uh, conditions. Secondly, T-SPAN7 also um, regulates the surface expression of um, the inotropic receptors that are the AMPA receptors in hippocampal neurons. And as these receptors are also expressed in the islets, uh, you would assume that loss of T-SPAN7 would increase the, uh, the surface localization of calcium permeable AMPA receptors, thereby leading to enhanced glutamate mediated calcium influx and islet hormone secretion. And the last and the most interesting role of T-SPAN7 in calcium handling is its interaction with the, uh, with the phosphatidyl inositol 4 kinase or PI4 kinase, which is important in the regulation of the membrane phospholipid uh, PIP2 uh, expression. And so uh, PIP2 is a known ion channel regulator whereby increase in PIP2 levels increases KDP channel activity leading to membrane hyperpolarization and inhibition of voltage dependent calcium channels. And so it is evident that T-SPAN7 uh, is likely to play a very important role in calcium handling in the islets. And so based on the information I've told you so far, we asked the question if T-SPAN7 regulates beta cell calcium handling and insulin secretion. And so this is me at the end of my part here and I'll hand it over to Matt who will uh, explain the results of our study. Hey, so thank you so much, Aria. And also, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our hosts for inviting us here to the Virtual Journal Club today to present some of our findings in this, this recent paper. Uh, okay, so uh, this is uh, the first figure from the paper. And so this shows uh, some immunofluorescent staining of mouse and pancreas sections that we did, showing um, high expression of T-SPAN7, uh, which you can see in green uh, in both beta cells uh, indicated by insulin staining in red, as well as glucagon staining in alpha cells shown in violet here. And so you can appreciate that within the endocrine um, islets, it's very highly expressed. 
However, it is uh, not present uh, as a protein anyway in the surrounding acinar tissue. Also, you can see at the bottom here, some more high resolution staining results showing that T-SPAN7 is not only uh, restricted to the plasma membrane of these uh, beta cells, but also it's distributed throughout the, the intercellular space. And so, um, and we also observe a very punctate staining pattern. So this seems to suggest that it could um, serve additional functions intracellularly in the islet in addition to at the plasma membrane. Uh, figure two here shows uh, the development of a lentiviral based shRNA um, delivery system that we utilize to knock down T-SPAN7 in both mouse and human islet cells. And so um, just for brevity's sake, throughout the, the presentation, I'll refer to as knockdown as KD uh, in the text. And so in the middle, you can see uh, this knockdown verified by immunofluorescent imaging. And on the right, you can see this uh, replicated via Western blotting. And so you can see that we got efficient knockdown of T-SPAN7 both in mouse as well as human islet cells. And so throughout the presentation, transduced cells were identified by the co-expression of an m uh, fluorescent reporter. In figure three, uh, I've broken this down into two different slides. The first slide here shows uh, the uh, influence of T-SPAN7 knockdown on the glucose-stimulated calcium entry into mouse beta cells within whole islets. And so here at the top, you can see the response um, to glucose, both at seven as well as 14 millimolar glucose into these uh, mouse islets. And so you can appreciate that T-SPAN7 knockdown increased glucose-stimulated calcium influx uh, at both glucose concentrations. However, the effect was much larger at 14 millimolar glucose. Uh, and then on the bottom, you can see that it also um, accelerated the calcium oscillation frequency of these mouse islets. And so this could be important because uh, as, as you may all well know, um, insulin uh, secretion in the body is pulsatile in nature. And so it could be that this is influencing that pulsatile release of insulin. The second half of the figure here uh, uh, shows the effect of T-SPAN7 knockdown on human beta cell calcium influx in response to glucose as well as depolarization with KCL. And so much like we saw for the mouse beta cells in human beta cells, T-SPAN7 knockdown increased the glucose stimulated calcium influx. Um, and we also, when we activated KTP and depolarized with KCL, we saw a similar effect. And so this is important because it's highly, it strongly suggests that T-SPAN7 is having a direct effect on beta cell calcium channels. And so to interrogate this potential effect, we next measured the effect of T-SPAN7 knockdown on um, calcium currents in both mouse and human beta cells. And so we focused on, for this paper, the effect on L-type calcium channels, as these are the primary channels by which calcium enters into beta cells. And so the way we did this using electrophysiology was we simulated um, these currents via the polarization of the beta cell plasma membrane uh, at a variety of different membrane potentials. And then we blocked L-type channels with azratapine and then subtracted the remaining currents from the total currents to arrive at L-type currents. And here you can see the results of the study. So on the top, you can see uh, the effects on L-type channels in mouse and human beta cells. And so you can appreciate that in both cases, we saw a significant increase in the size of L-type currents when T-SPAN7 was knocked down, whereas on the bottom, we saw no effect on non-L-type channel currents. Next, we were interested to determine if this was via a direct effect on the channel or through some sort of indirect mechanism. And so we uh, pulled down T-SPAN7 along with CAV 1.2 and 1.3, which are the predominant L-type channels expressed in um, beta cells. And so in both cases, we found that T-SPAN7 co-immunoprecipitates with these L-type channels from primary mouse or primary human islets. Uh, we confirmed this in a heterologous system where we overexpressed T-SPAN7 with HA tagged CAV 1.2 or 1.3 and found that once again, T-SPAN7 co-immunoprecipitates uh, in the presence of an anti-HA antibody, but not with an isotype uh, IgG control. Uh, and so we also were interested in determining if T-SPAN7 uh, affects the surface localization of these channels, uh, but in a heterologous system, we saw no effect, um, as you can see here in the bottom left. And then finally, we wanted to determine if we, we see, we wanted to show that we have functional channels. And so we looked at calcium influx through both 1.2 and 1.3 in response to a high uh, concentration of KCL and found that as with primary cells, uh, 
T-span seven in this case overexpression led to a decrease in CV channel currents or calcium influx. And so here in this figure, this is the first half of the figure. This is uh, an electrophysiological analysis of specifically CV 1.2 and CV 1.3. And so as predicted, when we overexpressed T-span seven, we saw a decrease in the size of both 1.2 and 1.3 currents, as you can see on the top. And we also saw an effect on activation and inactivation kinetics of the two channels in a channel dependent fashion. And so on the left, you can see that T-SPAN 7 reduced CAV 1.2 activation, the activation rate of CAV 1.2, whereas it decreased the 1.3 inactivation rate. And so we did have this sort of channel uh, dependent effect on the kinetics. And here in the second half of the figure, we examine the effect of T-SPAN 7 on voltage dependent inactivation of these channels, uh, specifically recovery uh, of the channels from voltage dependent inactivation. So basically what we were interested in, in looking at is that if you expose these channels to a prolonged activation, they slowly lose that activation over time. And so uh, from our results, we see that T-SPAN 7 overexpression actually accelerated recovery of 1.2 from this inactivation event, whereas 1.3 was not influenced. And then finally, uh, we wanted to um, look at another important ion channel in beta cells, which is KTP or ATP sensitive potassium channels. And so uh, in this case, we saw no effect on this channel. And so it, it seems to be that predominantly that T-SPAN 7 is affecting calcium handling in these beta cells through its effect on calcium channels. And so here in the last figure, we uh, examined the functional effect of T-SPAN 7 knockdown on insulin secretion from human beta cells. And so these studies were uh, conducted in dispersed human beta cells transduced with either um, shRNA uh, specific for T-SPAN 7 or a scramble shRNA. And so we looked at both basal insulin secretion on the left, as well as stimulated secretion on the right. And in both cases, we observed a significant increase in insulin secretion when T-SPAN 7 was knocked down. And so I just wanted to point out this, this effect at 5.6 millimolar glucose, which is a little surprising, uh, but not, not incredibly uh, unexpected because we did see a slight increase in uh, glucose stimulated calcium influx under um, seven millimolar glucose conditions. And so it could be that we're seeing a shift in the channels to being activated at lower uh, glucose concentrations uh, in the absence of T-SPAN 7. And so just to um, wrap up and summarize our major findings, we find that T-SPAN 7 interacts with CAV 1.2, reducing channel conductance and slowing channel activation. Uh, we also find that T-SPAN 7 interacts with CAV 1.3, which decreases channel conductance and decelerates inactivation kinetics. And these effects together limit glucose stimulated calcium influx, slow calcium oscillation frequency, and decrease insulin secretion. And so we conclude that T-SPAN 7 functions as a CAV channel regulatory subunit in beta cells. And so with that, I would just like to acknowledge uh, the Jacobson Lab, as you can see here at the bottom, as well as our collaborators at Vanderbilt, uh, Maria Pasifaro for providing the T-SPAN 7 uh, plasmid uh, for, that was used in these studies, as well as our funding sources. And with that, I would like to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Matt, uh, Ariane Matt. I think it was a very nice and clear presentation. Um, so, I just want to remind everyone that they can use the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of the screen to uh, write any question they have about this presentation and this work. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of time by uh, starting the discussion. So uh, I had a question for, for Paying first. Uh, so Paying, as, as a senior editor for the journal, uh, can you please tell us what you think made this paper stand out and, and also what, 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 what advice would you actually give um, to submit papers to the standard of the, of the journal? Well, I think, um, thank you, Nordine, for inviting me to this uh, forum. And I think that the thing that stood out about this paper for me is, is that it's conceptually innovative. Although this uh, phenomenon of the T-SPAN, I think it was 13, being shown previously in a neuronal system, it was taking a concept and extending it uh, to another system in, in a highly innovative and creative way. Uh, so as you know, the Journal of Physiology is uh, quite interested in studies that are non-incremental, but rather are conceptually innovative. Uh, and you outlined it also very well when you 
uh, highlighted the reason that you picked this out for a journal club topic as well. So really the journal is seeking studies that do detail these sorts of conceptual innovations as well as technical innovations. And in that latter case, that would basically go to uh, a techniques for physiology sort of manuscript. Uh, but what does conceptually innovative mean for most people? It means that it drives the field. It drives a field in a new direction and it'll exert a sustained and powerful influence on the field and possibly even beyond. I sort of saw that when it came into me through the uh, submission funnel through um, our, our uh, uh, editorial office. And as a senior editor, I thought that this would be a great exercise as well for a, a reviewing editor who at the time was an editorial fellow. Uh, we do have this program. And um, so Pavel drove this ship and he, he basically sent it out to those individuals who he thought were, were the most uh, highly qualified to assess his manuscript. The other thing is the technical rigor. The fact that you use many different sorts of outcome measures for probing your question, right? That you, you simply are not looking at something and putting it into a cookie cutter. And it's not a, it's, it's not sort of a, well, X does Y. And so we'll see whether X prime does the same thing to Y, right? It is, it is truly a, a, a novel and innovative um, study in my book. So thank you, Nordine. Yeah, thank you very much, Bing. Yeah, I completely agree about the fact that the, the use of like, multiple different techniques to show the same effects is actually make the paper very strong. Yeah. Uh, and I think that after reading the paper or listening to the presentation, we can't really argue that T-SPAN is not regulating uh, calcium channels. It's kind of obvious now. Um, so feel free to ask uh, any questions uh, using the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of the screen. I'm going to start uh, asking a couple of questions to the panel to give you a bit more time uh, to think about what you would like to hear about a bit more. Um, so my question is about the human primary cells you have been using. So I can see from the table you provided, the donor tables, that some of them were coming from males, some of them from females, the age groups were a bit different. I was wondering if you saw any gender effects or age effects in how T-SPAN is regulating the channels? Yeah, that's a great question. So you, yeah, we would love to do these sort of studies, uh, but it's kind of just kind of random who we get, right? And so we don't have a huge data set. Um, I will make a couple of kind of general comments though. Uh, we do see that above sort of like 30, 32 BMI. Uh, sometimes the islets don't perform the same way um, as, as BMI is below that. Um, and I, I know that other people in our lab um, seem to think that if the, the donor is a little younger, um, those islets tend to perform a little differently. I don't know, you can add to that if you'd like, David. Yeah, so the calcium handling does is, is uh, greatly influenced by the age of the donor. Um, and as you age, uh, there's some groups that say insulin secretion goes up, but there's uh, a, a few groups now that believe that insulin secretion goes, goes down as you age, and especially uh, in, with environmental context uh, of obesity and, and excess nutrition. Um, and so this calcium handling defect, we don't know if it's related to T-SPAN 7, but T-SPAN 7 doesn't change dramatically over the age uh, of an islet. And so if it is through T-SPAN 7, there are other modifications on T-SPAN 7, which could be affecting calcium channel activity, but likely there's also contributions of KATP channel activity because mitochondrial function decreases with obesity. Um, and so there's probably other contributions that are affecting calcium channels. There are a few questions now. Um, do you want me to answer those or do you want to answer those, Matt? Yeah, Can you so see I'll have a look. So it's, uh, or, there is a question from Muhajid uh, Nasir Hussain. So he's asking, can the excess of calcium influx via the membrane affects the rate of insulin secretion, especially to those suffering from diabetes? So the question is, can the influx affect the rate? Of insulin secretion, uh, especially for um, people suffering from diabetes. 
So I'm not sure about the rate, but the total amount would certainly be affected. And I would, I would assume that the dy dynamics would be as well. Uh, I can't say for sure because we haven't done those, those assays, but I would think yes. And I, I can follow up a little bit. So Sebastian Barg has found that if, in order to get typical insulin granule release, um, what you need is these calcium channels coming together. You can watch them in real time. They come together and form these clusters of about eight calcium channels next to each other that allow for proper calcium release at, at the granule, or calcium entry at the granule. And this allows for uh, insulin granule fusion with the membrane and subsequent insulin release. And if you look at type two diabetic islets, you lose this clustering and thus you're losing that little microdomain of calcium. So it's the microdomains of calcium that that we think are more important uh, during insulin secretion and are disrupted in diabetic settings. Okay. Thank you, Martin David. Um, there is a follow-up question from Mujahid, which we kind of already touched upon. So he's asking, is there any differences between the rate of conduction of calcium into the membrane based on body mass index of individual? So I can answer a little bit. So what we do know is that there is different phases of calcium influx. And so when you stimulate with glucose, what you get is this big burst in calcium influx, which leads to first phase insulin secretion. And you lose a lot of this. And so it's the amount of calcium coming in. And that has to do with rate because you just don't have it coming in as fast. So not as many of the calcium channels are opening. They're not clustering and you're not getting as robust of a calcium influx. Uh, in patients with type 2 diabetes, and this is reducing what we know as first phase insulin secretion. It also affects second phase a little bit, but, but predominantly first phase. And interestingly, different calcium channels affect different phases of insulin secretion. If you knock out CAV 1.2 in a mouse beta cell, you lose first phase insulin secretion. Interestingly, if you knock out 1.3, you get compensation by overexpression of 1.3, uh, or excuse me, 1.2. And so this compensates for the loss of 1.3. And so um, there are differences in terms of these calcium channels and what types of insulin secretion they regulate. And as you talked about earlier with skeletal muscle, some people also believe that the ryanidine receptor is important here and that different calcium channels interact closely with the ryanidine receptor 1.2 in particular. And this allows for calcium induced calcium release from the ER, which stimulates more uh, insulin secretion. And that's also disrupted uh, in type 2 diabetes. And Andrew Marks has some nice work on ryanidine receptor mutations that affect insulin secretion and calcium induced calcium release. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I have a bit of a technical question. Um, it's, you know, when you do the pull down experiments, so this is what you use to show that T-SPAN is directly interacting with uh, CAV 1.2 and CAV 1.3. How can you rule out that it's not an indirect interaction, that there is always an accessory protein that is co-precipitated that actually does, you know, um, the interaction, if you see what I mean. So how can you be sure this is direct? Yeah, so that's a really great question. And it, it could be that this is a, a protein complex. Um, the, the way we try to minimize um, nonspecific interactions, at least, is we use detergents and um, BSA and, and, and different serums. Um, but yeah, the, I would fully expect that this is probably a multi-protein complex because we know that T-SPAN 7 interacts with a variety of different proteins, AMP receptors, dopamine receptors, um, pick one. So that's actually something we're really currently looking into. We're developing a system where we can pull down T-SPAN 7 from primary cells or even cell lines and, and send that off um, for analysis. And we're, we're really interested in building that interactome of T-SPAN 7 for um, not only beta cells, but alpha cells and delta cells. So I might add something about that actually. When you say you're sending those out for analysis, you're, um, are you suggesting you're doing mass spec on this to see what other things are coming down? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So uh, another suggestion to get around that would be to, to see whether there actually is a direct interaction would be to perform some surface plasmon resonance work with uh, synthetic <laughs> constructs, right? Or pieces of the T-span and then flowing over pieces of this uh, calcium channel and seeing whether or not the binding affinities are in alignment with, with that kind of interaction. 
That's actually a great idea. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. And, and that's something that we can do. We have, and we have now members uh, of the MPV community at Vanderbilt that are, we've got a new Titan Krios that we can start doing maybe crystallization as well to see if it interacts with the voltage sensing domain. And so when we make the protein, we can try both approaches. Yeah. Um, and you guys got great toys over there. <laughs> it's not, well, they just got it up and running, so we're not going to be the first in line, but oh. we're definitely thinking about those experiments, and that's a wonderful idea. Thank you. Yep. Looking forward uh, to seeing it. <laughs> I guess the fact that both of them are membrane proteins doesn't really make it especially easy, but uh, what's not easy makes it even more interesting. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you a quick question about uh, VDI. So you looked at VDI for these channels and you saw um, an, an effect for one of them. Is there, a, so I'm not very familiar with, with islet cells to be honest, but do you have also CDI in this, um, in, in, the, in the glucose stimulated insulin secretion? Would the calcium also inactivate the channel? Yes, it can. And that's definitely something that we in the future should probably look into. Uh, we just are kind of working through everything one by one, one step by at a time. Yeah, cool. Yeah, we, but yeah that's, that's something also for, um, we're interested in the effects on AMP receptors. And so that's also um, going to be important there. Okay, great. So there is quite quite a few questions now on the Q&A, so I'm going to go through them. Um, so um, someone from the audience is asking, why does T-SPAN knockdown cause a greater reduction in glucose-stimulated calcium entry compared to KCL stimulated calcium entry? Yeah, that's, that's a great question as well. Um, this is something that we've noticed. We see larger effects of the knockdown on the glucose stimulated insulin or calcium entry. And so this, I mean, this is consistent with what we saw um, with basal insulin secretion. Uh, so it does appear that when that T-SPAN 7 is important for setting that, that threshold for channel activation, and while we don't have any proof of anything right now, one thing I've been curious about recently is that uh, I found uh, in a paper that T-SPAN 7 interacts with um, cellular prion protein, which has been shown to affect um, iron trafficking in islets and also um, through that um, glucose transporters. And so it could be that T-SPAN 7 is playing a role in uh, glucose transport into the, the beta cells. And so this is something that I'm interested in, in probing in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is a question from Nicholas Huron. So he says, thank you both uh, for your presentations, very clear. Do you have any evidence that T-SPAN 7 is altered in vivo in diabetic humans versus controls? Is it known how non-pharmacologic non intervention affect T-SPAN 7 levels in vivo in humans? for example, the effect of exercise and or diets? Uh, thanks for the question. This is something that I'm very curious about as well. Um, I don't have great answers yet. Uh, I can tell you what we know. Uh, so uh, at least at an RNA level, it doesn't appear that uh, diabetic conditions or stressful conditions um, affect uh, T-SPAN 7 uh, mRNA levels. Uh, there are some studies, though, in the literature showing that in, in a mouse model, um, T-SPAN 7 is affected under certain high-fat diet conditions. And so um, we don't really know how that applies in vivo for humans. Uh, it's something that we're, we're, we're looking into in the future. Um, as far as different inputs that could change the levels of T-SPAN 7 in vivo, that's also a really intriguing question that we would very much like to look into in the future, but right now I can't really comment on that, but it is, is something that, that I would like to look into in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I have a quick question about the CAV 1.2 and CAV 1.3. So T-spine is regulating both, but differently. Um, so my question is, so, so what do you think in terms of physiology this is actually doing? Uh, the fact that two channels that are pretty much doing, you know, the same thing about, you know, letting the calcium in, they are not going to be re regulated the same way. And um, and my follow-up question is, in, in one of your figure, when you look at the, the IV curve for the CAV 1.3, you have the right shift, like the activation curve, instead of being activated at like minus 20, it's more like close to zero. Do you think this has any significance? Um... 
was there a difference? I, I thought I analyzed this data and I, I didn't see a statistical difference okay. on activation. It could have been close, maybe. Yeah, we, um, we, it looks like there is a, a difference, but maybe it's not statistical. We're talking about and when we overexpressed it in the hex cells, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, maybe I didn't analyze that. It might have just been the the primary cells that I analyzed. Um, so it could be that um, this plays back into what we noticed with the calcium, right? Because if it activates more, more at more hyperpolarized membrane potentials, it could be that could account for that increased calcium and the increased uh, insulin secretion that we observed. Um, as far as, well, can you uh, remind me of the first part of your question? I wasn't sure what the question was exactly. So, so, so one part of the question was, so you have CAV 1.2 and 1.3 that are apparently regulated differently by T-SPAN. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what do you think, what does it mean in, in terms of physiology? Because, so one of them is affecting the activation, the other one is more affecting the inactivation. So what would you say would be the, the role, is, is there like a particular role of these channels? Um, yeah, so it seems to be that like the overarching effect is to sort of limit the, um, the conductance through these channels. And so it could be to just control, kind of put an upper limit on the amount of calcium that enters mm -hmm. into these cells. So because if you have too much calcium over time, that can that can lead to, to major changes in the, um, the nature of that cell as far as uh, protein expression and, uh, and transcripts go. Um, and it feels like it's, it's kind of, kind of ubiquitous across a number of different, um, calcium channels, right? Um, because in addition to 1.2 and 1.3, there is 1.2 and 1.3, there is some evidence that it also affects, um, CV 2.1 in a similar fashion, which is also, um, important in the islet uh, in terms of glucagon secretion from alpha cells. And so it feels like sort of this master can, control switch for, for calcium channels. Okay, thank you. And the voltage dependent inactivation is really important as well because it, as you build up more inactivation, you're not gonna have those microdomain, those little bursts of calcium happening to, to enough extent to stimulate insulin secretion. So it could mm -hmm. drastically affect insulin secretion if you have more inactivation. And, and interestingly, under glucose stimulation, you depolarize the membrane potential right to the level the threshold for activation of the voltage dependent calcium channels. And this is controlled by pass passing channels, obviously, but as you become diabetic, that changes the membrane potential from where the plateau potential sits. And this really uh, drastically affects calcium entry um, and would be even further regulated or dysregulated without T-SPAN 7, because you would uh, have more inactivation of those CAV 1.2 channels. And so we're not sure if you, want to take it away or keep it, it might be serving an important role in preventing inactivation during sustained glucose stimulation, such as under diabetic conditions. Yeah, it's a great point. And in, in these, these proteins, they are important for forming microdomains, these tetraspan enriched microdomains. And so this could play an important role in that clustering of uh, calcium channels, beta cells. Yeah. Really intriguing um, concept that we are starting to get into. Great. Thank you, Matt and David. Um, there is uh, another question from Mujahid. So, and I will have a follow-up on this one. So he's asking, are there some drugs that affect the activity of T-SPAN7 in humans? And I also wanted to ask, do you think that T-SPAN7 uh, calcium channel interaction is druggable? And would it be of any use uh, in terms of, you know, controlling uh, uh, glucose levels in humans? Yeah, so first of all, to, to be, the best of my knowledge, there's no uh, drugs that affect the activity of T-SPAN 7. Um, but as far as a concept, I think it is a really uh, cool concept because uh, there are, um, like Ari was talking about uh, with the gamma subunits, um, they're in that same family, there are um, uh, subunits that interact with AMP receptors uh, called TARPs. Uh, and so those, I know that, that, that people are drugging uh, those AMP receptors with specific TARPs, like TARP accessory protein. And so I think it would be possible uh, in the future to perhaps target the calcium channels with T-SPAN7 
as an accessory subunit. And the director, if it's ever, I'm not sure if it, if it would be good to reduce or over um, stimulate that interaction at this point, but. It should be druggable based on the, the TARP based pharmacology that they have right now. Um, and, and they're just looking, and for us, it would be really easy to do a, a, a drug screen because you could just overexpress both and see uh, at what point you increase calcium channel activity and then prove it was through T-SPAN7 interaction or uh, lack of interaction through the drug uh, mediated. Uh, but it's a, the drugs are all just mediating the interactions of these protein complexes. Thank you very much. We, uh, it's, very, it's very exciting and interesting, but we're running out of time now. Uh, I've got like a couple of more questions, but I guess I will have to keep them for later. Uh, I would like to thank everyone from att for attending and all the panelists uh, for their time today. And um, I just want to remind everyone that there is a networking session uh, starting pretty much in the next couple of minutes. So Rosie is going to post the, the link on the chat. So um, yeah, here it is. So everyone is, is more than welcome to join. And, uh, and uh, I hope I will see you in the, in the next room in the next couple of minutes. And uh, everyone have a nice day and stay safe. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.